Welcome to the Budget Mom YouTube channel. I'm Kamiko Love from thebudgetmom.com and today we're doing a little bit of a different video. I'm going to be taking you with me as I make two sourdough loaves, one with inclusion, which is jalapeno and cheddar, and the other one plain. Now, before I even do anything, because I know I'm gonna have people coming at me, I know there's gonna be sourdough experts out there, people who are doing sourdough for a really long time, probably showing up in my comments saying, you did that wrong, you did that, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Here's the thing with sourdough, there is no right or wrong way to do it. So basically, you know, there's certain way to do things and some people do it one way, some people do it the other way, and we all believe that one way is the right way. I don't. I do whatever works for me, my environment, my kitchen, my starter. Now, I'm also going to say I am not an expert, okay? I only started my sourdough journey about three and a half, four months ago, and I failed on my starter three times. I threw three of them away when I probably shouldn't have. It took my fourth try and over eight weeks for it to actually be active enough for me to use where I felt like it, I could use it. Now in that time, because I could not for the life of me get a starter from scratch to work. So for me, like I said, I, I failed with my starter for about three times, which was about a month and a half, two months. I failed because I threw it away when I probably shouldn't have. So here's the thing. Sourdough is going to teach you a couple of different things. Number one, patience. Number two, trust the freaking process because it may not look like, like sometimes I look at my dome like, how the heck is this gonna be a loaf of bread? Sometimes I look at my starter and I'm like, eh, it probably shouldn't smell like that. But you know what? For me, I've always figured a way to make it work. It works out. So trust the process, continue with the process, even when in the beginning stages, it looks like a pile of crap. So with all that being said, okay, I'm not an expert. I'm here just sharing what I have learned and what has worked for me. Now, I have used one recipe and one recipe only. I stuck with that recipe. And then as I began to learn my starter and learn my dough, I moved on to tweaking that recipe to produce better loaves. My recommendation is that you use only one recipe because if you're switching recipes and you're doing, there's so many sourdough recipes out there. If you go and you use and start using all of them, you're never really going to know what's working for you and what's not. Another thing, what works for one person might not work for you because the environment in which you're making your sourdough plays a role. And each one of our, all of our kitchens are different. We all keep our houses at different temperatures. We might be baking at different seasons, might be really cold outside in winter. Might, you might be watching a video where someone's making it in the dead heat of summer. It all plays a role. This is why it's very important to learn your dough and your starter. So another thing, I learned sourdough one, by having just a straight passion to learn, a determination to not only learn the skill, but to master it. So I was consistently baking sourdough loaves that were good. Not perfect, because you're never get. I never feel like, don't feel like you're ever going to get to a perfect loaf, but good. And for me, I feel like on this journey, the best thing that I did to learn was watching videos, being a part of Facebook groups, and reading. So go on to Facebook, type in sourdough. Now I'm a part of Sourdough Geeks and Sourdoughs for Beginners. That's the two Facebook groups I'm a part of. The books I found most helpful on my journey, The Art of Sourdough Scoring, Artists in Sourdough, made simple this one here and then the next one is the perfect loaf this one really taught me just not how to make bread but the science and chemistry behind why it works the way it does 
So this one's a really good, if you are wanting to know the insides of outs of the chemistry reactions of things, and like this is a deep dive if you really want to know. I think it's important to know that this, this is going to teach you how to know and understand what your starter and dough is telling you. So those are the books. And as far as watching videos, I just jump on YouTube and I watch other people do it. Knowing in my mind that I'm not going to copy their process exactly because I can't because my environment is different. But it teaches me different techniques. It's like, hmm, I never thought about that. So reading, being part of Facebook groups and watching videos. And I did that for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. I did not just jump into this and end up where I am today. Today, I'm now consistently baking loaves that I'm really proud of to the point where I am gifting. And I've sold a couple. I am in my head telling myself, I'm not going to start a micro bakery. I'm not going to start a micro bakery. So right now, it's just gifting to friends. I gift anywhere between seven to eight loaves a week to friends and family. And I sell a couple in there in between. Um, so for me, that's what fills my heart. I had the financial um, opportunity to not have to sell my dough, instead to be able to really gift this, which is something that like I said, just fills my heart. That's what brings me the joy, being able to share this passion of mine and really good bread, homemade bread, healthy bread to friends and family. So with all that said, I'm hoping I covered everything in there. When you start this journey, you're going to read, like I said, there's many ways to do things. First and foremost, when I talk about my starter, I feed with a one, one, one ratio equal parts of starter, equal parts with water and flour. So like I do 50 grams of starter, 50 grams of water, 50 grams of flour. Now you may hear of a one five five ratio, which is like say 10 grams of starter, 50 grams of water, 50 grams of flour. What feeding ratio you feed your starter, it matters to an extent, I will switch to a one five five ratio if I feel like my starter is a little acidic and it's weak. If it's really runny and acidic and it's it kind of smells like nail polish remover, it's just basically telling me it's hungry. There's nothing you don't need to throw it away. It's just saying I need a different feeding schedule. So I'll feed it a one five five ratio for a couple of days, and then go back to my one 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 ratio. Another thing, I am not the type of person that puts my starter in the fridge just because I am baking with it consistently. I would say on a consistent level. Pretty much, like I said, I'm doing about eight, six to eight loaves a week. On top of, I do discard. And I'll, I'll, I'll be sharing that process with you. I'm going to share feeding my starter after I make bread. But discard is essentially... This is the way I do it. I know that there are other methods out there where you don't have to discard at all. I know that there are other sourdough uh, makers out there that think discard is wasteful, that you shouldn't do it. I mean, there's very strong opinions. Be kind to me in the comments. It's just what I do. And the reason I do it is because I use up every single ounce of my discard because I do discard recipes. I make crackers. I make pizza crust. I make banana breads and other types of breads. I make like scones. I make biscuits. I make, I, let me just say this. I have not bought a single bread item from the store in the last two months since starting my sour. I literally just go to my fridge, pull out my sourdough discard and make whatever recipe I need to make. They are so simple with the sourdough discard recipes. You can, I can make a batch of crackers in less than an hour. So, or I can just literally dump some of my discard in a pan and I have pizza crust. So for me, I feel like one, with me not buying any bread products at the store saves a little bit of money, but also it's just healthier. Um, and so I use up all my discard. I enjoy the discard process. Discard is essentially when you feed your starters, you're going to go to your starter, you're going to put the amount of starter that you need into a clean jar. I'm a clean jar junkie. It's the process that I use. I, I, every time I feed my starter, I'm feeding it in a clean jar instead of reusing the same old jar that it's already in. 
you're going to dump the amount of starter. So one, one, one ratio, 50 grams of starter in that clean jar, 50 grams of water, 50 grams of flour. Mix it all together. You just fed your starter. Um, the type of flour that I use, and I'll put all of my sourdough products that I'm talking about in this video down in the description caption of this video. I use King Arthur flour. So when I feed my starter, I'm using a King Arthur unbleached all-purpose flour. When I'm making my loaves and I'm making bread, I use the King Arthur bread flour. So, and I've only used those ones. Those are the only ones. I have no experience with any other ones. So I have no idea if you come at me in the comments of Miko, what do you think about this flour? What do you think about using rye, whole wheat? Now I will say, when I want my starter to be a little more, have a little, mm, be a little more active, I will dump in, I don't even measure it. I will dump in like a spoonful of rye flour. That extra high uh, protein content in that rye flour is going to give your starter a little boost. Well, it will, I, for me, notice mine rises better when I have the rye flour, but I don't do it all the time because I've read that if you're constantly using rye flour in your starter, it can actually make your starter weaker. I don't know if that's true. Okay. Like I said, I'm not an expert in this. I have no idea what I'm really talking about. It's just what I've read and what I've kind of like steered away from what, and what has worked for me. I only do that occasionally. Okay. I know that was a big sourdough dump of crap of information. And sourdough is one of those things. It is a process of love. If you gift sourdough, it is a gift of love because the sourdough that I make, I make over a two to three day process. A lot of it is hands off. A lot of it, you are waiting for your bread to do things. A lot of it is cold fermenting in the fridge for a long period of time. Now, we're going to be talking about bulk ferment and cold ferment in different Facebook groups. And when you're reading online, you might read the term, the abbreviation BF and CF. BF is bulk ferment, which is your first rise of your dough. You're going to put it out on your counter. The cold ferment or cold, um, I think it's called cold ferment, is where it goes in the fridge before, um, after your final shaping, it goes in the fridge. And then you take it out of the fridge and you can score it and then bake it. So this is what I know. Like I said, be kind to me in the comments. All right, let's get this process started. It's about 6.40 in the morning and I am just woke up. I'm going to be starting two loaves today and kind of walking you through this process with me. A couple of things I want to mention. Number one, I am not using peaked starter. Okay, so I fed my um, starters last night about 6.42 in the evening. It is now 6.42, about 6.40 um, in the morning. So it's been about 12 hours. They have peaked and dropped. It's, it's still at my double line, but it is definitely dropped. I've never done it like this using my starter. Um, after it's peaked and dropped, I always use it when it is at its peak. Um, so we're going to see if it turns out today. I'm also not using fresh jalapenos for this. I grow um, my own food and veggies during the summer. We do a ton of peppers. One of the things we, we do um, grow is jalapenos. We can those and then we use those throughout the winter months. When I can my jalapenos, I use them in a pressure canner. I don't pickle them. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take them out of the can. I'm going to let them lay on some paper towels, kind of get a lot of that moisture as much as I can out of those jalapenos. That's what I'm going to be using in my loaves today. So let's get the process started and let me show you kind of the ingredients that I'm going to be using today besides the inclusions. So these are my starters, uh, Dolores and Sarize a lot. Now Sarize a lot um, is the starter that I started from scratch. Dolores, um, you can say it, see it says H and C right there. Um, Homestead and Chill, I bought that from someone else. It was a dehydrated starter and then I reactivated it. Um, both starters work great for me. I use both in my baking a lot with sourdough. You're going to need a scale, a bowl, either a flour a tea towel or um, some type of towel like this. 
couple of bowls. I use the salt I use in my sourdough is kosher salt and bread flour and of course water. That's, that's all you need. Flour, water, and salt. And if you go to the store and you flip over a, a bag of sourdough bread, you'll see it has like 15 ingredients. Sourdough is only bread flour, water, and salt. Okay, so hopefully you can see this okay. So I have my um, scale here, put my bowl on the scale. And I'm also gonna share my recipe with you. So I already did one loaf using the Rise A Lot starter. And now, I'm just gonna get my spatula. I'm gonna use 100 grams of Dolores. So measure out 100 grams. Like I said, I'm not really sure how this is gonna be with the starters peaking and dropping like that. I've never done that before, but we'll see. Okay, so we got about 100, 101, 100, 100 grams of starter. Okay, now I like to use warm water straight from my tap. The reason being we're on a well, um, so I'm not too worried about the different like chlorine in my water. Um, I do sometimes when I feed my starter, I use water from a pitcher that I let sit on the counter where the chlorine can evaporate. Um, but today for my recipes, I just use some warm water. Okay, so we had my um, 100 grams of starter in there, and now I'm going to put in my 350 grams of warm water. I'm gonna zero out my scale. So I'm adding that 350 grams of warm water. Now, if I go over, like I went over by five grams, I'll just take a spoon and dump some of it out. Okay, so I like to use a bread whisk like this, it's a tool like this, um, and you want to just get it so you are mixing that water and starter into a soupy, muddy mix. Doesn't have to be, you don't have to dissolve your entire starter in there. I like to get it pretty soupy where that starter is broken down into that water pretty well. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our bread flour. Now the flour that you use matters a lot. Um, I use a high protein, um, so the one I use is a, a King Arthur bread flour. And when I feed my starters, which I'll show you uh, the process as well of that, I use the um, King Arthur unbleached all-purpose flour. But for today's recipe, I am using the King Arthur bread flour, and you need 500 grams of that. So I'm just gonna put it into my bowl. I zeroed out my scale, so now I'm adding 500 grams. And like I said, if you add too much, just take it off, put some away. I try to get my measurements as exact as possible, so I have some type of consistency within my loaves. Okay, so now what I do with my salt, you need 10 grams of kosher salt. And I like to put it in a smaller bowl just because I feel like when I add it to my big bowl, it doesn't measure as accurately because it's such a small amount. All right, so we're at eight grams now. 10 grams, okay, so 10 grams. I mean, it's really not that much. So I'm just gonna add that into my bowl. Now the next thing that I do is I use these bowl scrapers, these bendable silicone type bowl scrapers or bread scrapers. And you just start mixing your bread or your dough until it becomes a shaggy dough. And there has been a lot of times where I thought that I was doing this wrong. And I'm like, you know, during this process, like I said, I'm not an expert in this. Most of the time I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing or if this is even right. I feel like sourdough is kind of forgiving. Like, I don't think I've had a, a bread or dough or loaf that has turned out 
like horribly bad if I kind of, you know, give yourself grace to learn. So you want to make sure what I do when I'm doing this, I just make sure that there's no more flour on the bottom of this bowl. I make sure all the flour gets incorporated into that dough. So I just keep scraping it along the bowl. And sometimes what you might have to do, you might have to get rid of the scraper and just use your hands. That's okay too. That's the whole fun process of the making sourdoughs, getting your hands into the dough. You, you really do learn the dough. Okay, so I'll try to get as much of this off my hands as possible. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna cover and let this sit for an hour. And the point here is we really want that water to soak up into that flour. We want them to be fully incorporated. So we're gonna let that flour soak up the water for about an hour. Now, what I use is these are flour sack towels. You can get a pack of them of like 25 on Amazon. I make it damp and this is how I cover my dough. Now you're gonna set a timer and let that sit for an hour. Let's go ahead and feed my starters. Sariza Law and Dolores had 100 grams taken away from them. And you can see I have some, and I'm sorry, the lighting is not the best just because it's still dark here, but there's not a lot left in my jar. And anytime I feed my starter, I'm a clean jar junkie. So I always have clean jars labeled. I, always, I only have two. I have these ones I got from a company called Sour House. That's where I got these containers. These um, type of jars, these WEC jars, I got from Amazon. And these are the only two I have. So I like to keep them labeled. So Dolores, we're going to start with her first. And I will tell you what, naming your starters is good luck. Mine did not, I feel activate really until I named them. That's when I started having good luck with my starter. I don't know if that's a thing, but they say in the sourdough world that if you name your starter, it's good luck. So think about naming your starter now if you haven't. Okay, so I just get what I can out of my jar. I measure it out because I do a one, one, one ratio feed. So let's see how much starter I can get out of this jar. I mean, you'd be surprised too how little of starter you need to really build yours back up again. I've seen on videos on social media, people with like two grams of starter left and they've, they've gotten their starters back. Um, so don't be too worried if you use quite a bit of it. Okay, so I have a good amount. This is actually a very good amount. I have 46 grams. So then, like I said, I keep water in a pitcher out on my counter. That means when I feed my starter, not only do I have water where the chlorine has fully evaporated out, I am now using room temperature water to feed my starter. I have no idea if this makes a difference, um, but it seems to be great for my starters. So 47 grams, it's now changed 47 grams. So I'm gonna do, so you have 47 grams of your starter. 40 gram, seven grams of water. So I'm gonna put in 47 grams of water here. And then I am going to, and it doesn't, I mean, I'm at 48 grams. I don't really have to make it exact. Now, remember I said when I feed my starters, I don't use the bread flour that I use to make my dough. I use the King Arthur unbleached all purpose flour. So then you're gonna zero out your scale and you're gonna add 47 grams of flour. Now, one of the things that I have really learned on my sourdough journey is that your starters are like, I mean, they're their own unique thing. I did 49 grams of flour, not exact. But here's where you need to learn your starter. And what I mean by that, you will start to learn when consistency is right. And you can see it's like, this is like the consistency that I get at mine too. It's like a thick, 
a cake batter consistency. It's not super runny. It's not super dry and thick where it's turning into a dough ball. It's like a thick batter consistency. It's the only way I can describe it. That starter is fed. Del- Del- Dolores is fed. She's happy. She's full. And I am kind of crazy about this, but I try to get all the starter off of my spatula and back into the bowl. It's kind of like this game I play. I don't know why it matters to me. It shouldn't matter, but it does. We all have our things. Okay, so Dolores has been fed. Now, the one the containers from Sour House comes with these kind of lids. They just pop on. Okay, Dolores has been fed now. Let's do Sarize a lot. So get Sarize a lot on the scale. Let's see how much we can get at a Sarize a lot jar. Always make sure to reset your scale. I've done that many times where I have not, and I've had to guess things out, but it all works out. Okay. So we're currently at 37 grams. Zeroing out the scale, 38 grams of water. Zeroing out the scale, adding my flour, 38 grams. And if I add the 38 grams, you'll notice last time I did a little bit more than 38 grams. If I do 38 grams and I notice that it's still a little runny and it's not the consistency I want, I'll add a little bit more flour. This is a good consistency. I like this consistency. So we're going to keep it. 38 grams of the flour. Okay. Like I said, it's kind of that thick cake batter consistency. And we'll get our lid, stick it on. So we just, after using our starters um, to make bread, we refed them. All right, so while the dough is still in auto lease, um, that's what the process is called when we are letting that water soak into that flour and have it really combine well. Um, let me take you over to where I keep my starters and show you that entire setup. So I keep my starter out on the counter at all times. I bake about once, two, three times a week, depending on, I have a small child baby, so depending on my time. So I keep both out on my counter. Now, so Rise a lot stays out in the open. She rises and doubles really, really well. Dolores does too. I got this container from Sour House and essentially it keeps your starter at the very exact temperature for the best rise environment for your starter. I think it's like 78 degrees or something like that. So when it's yellow like this, it's telling me that inside of this dome, the dome just pops off. It's at the the the, be- the very best temperature it can be to make your starter the most active to use. Now, I also keep over here a wet erase marker um, that I use to write on, especially when I, if you are just starting out, you need to learn your starter. You need to know when it's at peak, how long it's at peak, how long it takes to peak. And I know that seems very overwhelming. So what I do is I use a wet erase marker and I just write on there a line of where my starter is the moment I feed it, it's in the jar, in the time. Every couple of hours, I'll come back and mark another line and the time. I come back in another couple hours, mark the, another line and the time. This shows me, one, that my starter is growing if it's doubling. And if I come back in an hour or so and I can watching it still seeing it's at peak, then I know like how long my starter is at peak and how high it's going to get. You will start to learn your starter and what it does. So I, like I said, I keep these out on my counter at all times. Now the jar, I apologize, my counter is messy because, well, I have my son's iPad, but Over here is where I keep my jar of my water. So this is my kitchen counter over here. 
And let me just grab this jar. So my jar of water, remember this jar of water, I, I literally just keep it right there. And that's what I, I just leave it out on the counter and that's what I use to feed my starters right here. And that's my starter setup. Okay, so while we're waiting for this, I got my jalapenos out and I'm, I'm um, drying them on a paper towel. Remember, I had mine canned, so they've been sitting in a water solution um, for about six and a half, seven months. And I don't know, anytime I use any type of inclusion that's really wet, it's scary for me. Maybe it's because the last time I used a wet inclusion that produces a lot of hydration, a lot of liquids. Um, I used fresh blueberries in a loaf and it like, it turned out okay, but my inside of my loaf was a lot gummier than I wanted. And so now anytime I go to use inclusions that have a lot of liquid, I get scared. <laughs> so we're drying these off a little bit. And that could be maybe because when I used those blueberries, it was my first time ever doing inclusions and I had no idea how to add them. I still kind of don't, but I did watch a YouTube video on how to add inclusions in your loaf. Also, when I pulled out my jalapenos, the last two cans that I had, it kind of looks like I only have enough for one loaf with jalapenos. I don't know. Maybe I can get away with two. It's so hard to tell. Let me show you what they look like. This is, um, these are my canned jalapenos that I have sitting out on a paper towel, just drying, trying to get rid of as much liquid as I can. I might have enough to do two loaves. I mean, the way I picture it is just down the middle, one loaf, another loaf. So I might, I think I might. Um, so yeah, that should be enough, but those are drying out as we wait. Okay, so you might hear some baby sounds in the background, that's okay. So it's been an hour and this is what our dough currently looks like. And you might be saying like, oh my gosh, that does not look good. It's okay, it's going to come together. One of the things I've learned is trust the process, trust the process. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna call forming, it's called forming up the dough. And I'm gonna form it into a ball. So what I'm gonna do, if it's a really wet dough, you can put some water on your hands to help with that dough sticking. I'm gonna give it a shot without, well, it, you know, I might just, okay. So what I do is I get up underneath the dough and I pull and I bring it towards the center. Go around, pull, bring it to the center around, pull, bring to the center, around, and you're gonna go around the bowl, and you're gonna pull that dough to the center of the ball, like this. Now, the point here is, one, we're incorporating it, and we're getting it to come together a little bit more, but we're gonna try to shape it into a ball the best that we can. Now, as you go around and you do this, you might start to notice that it's starting to, um, not let you pull on it anymore. It's starting to become tight. See, it's not giving me a, a lot of pull. You just wanna go around and get this into somewhat of a ball shape. All right, so after we're done with this, the ball now looks like this. Not too bad, it's come together a little bit. You want to recover with your towel and now you're gonna let that sit for 30 minutes. So let's go ahead and do the other one. Bring it over, same thing, this shaggy looking dough, but it will come together, trust the process. So around, under, pull, around, under, pull, around, under, pull, around, under, pull, around, under, pull. Just like that, keep pulling it around. Now it shouldn't take you a lot of times to get it into a, a dough-like ball that's come together. I mean, you shouldn't have to do this more than, I don't know, 10 times or so. Like I said, you'll start to learn. You'll start to feel like, okay, this feels right. So what I do is I just keep doing it until it becomes where it doesn't, it has a little bit of tension to the, dough it doesn't let me bring it back okay see that's perfect for me so what we're gonna do we're gonna cover and we're gonna let this rest for 30 minutes
Okay, so it's been 30 minutes, and now we're going to start our stretch and folds. Stretch and folds, or another way of building up gluten in your dough, is doing a coil fold. If you are interested in coil folds, just Google coil fold, and you'll, a bunch of videos will pop up on how to do it. I don't do them. I use the stretch and fold method. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a set of stretch and folds for the next two hours every 30 minutes. My goal is to do four stretch and folds over two hours, at least, that's the minimum. Sometimes you could do five. So let's go ahead, I'm gonna show you how I do these stretch and folds. So it's, it's a lot like how we brought the dough together for a ball. You're going to put your hands underneath and you're gonna go along and pull it towards the center of your dough ball. And you'll notice too, when it no longer allows you, so I just go all the way around, that one's done. You're gonna cover with your damp towel, and now we're gonna let that sit for 30 minutes. You're gonna do that again. I'm gonna do that again with my second loaf here. Bring it over. Like I said, if it's a really moist, really hydrated, sticky type of dough. You can put a little water on your hands. It'll help with some sticking. But see how it's allowing me to just bring it together in the center. Okay, that one's done. So now we're gonna cover it with a towel again. And if your towel dries out, you can put a little more water, dampen it again. So that one's gonna sit for 30 minutes. And then we're gonna repeat that process again in 30 minutes for our second set of stretch and folds. I just did my second set of stretch and folds and I forgot to turn on the video. <laughs> so <laughs> this is what my dough looks like after my second stretch, my second set of stretch and folds. So I started this, I was actually recording other parts of this video and I forgot to turn on my camera. So, it happened and I did it a half hour later than what I was supposed to, that's okay. Like I said, this doesn't have to be like on the mark all the time. It's, it's really great because you can really make this process work around your schedule. So finish my second set of stretch and folds. It is now 10.05, I'm gonna come back in another half hour and do my third set of stretch and folds. Okay, I didn't forget this time. <laughs> so we're on our third set of stretch and folds. It is now 10.35 in the morning. Remember, I started this process, like I mixed my, the dough at very first at six, about 6.40 in the morning. So here we are, it is now 10.35, and I am doing my third set of stretch and folds. So I'm gonna get this dough. Do you see how it's become a lot smoother of a dough, easier to work with? That's how I know it's working. Like if it's okay, this is okay. So we're just gonna put that down like that. All right, say that one is done. We're gonna recover it with our damp towel and we're gonna move on to our second loaf. Now, I wanna say very quickly, there are people out there who will do both of these doughs together in one bin where they don't have two separate bowls like this. My problem is, is I feel like I don't really have a big enough bowl where I could mix double loaves, two loaves in one bowl and have enough room for it to rise. So I have to split mine for now because I haven't bought a bigger bin to make multiple loaves at one time. So I'm breaking my loaves down into different bowls and that's okay. You, you use what you have at home and make it work. Okay. So all right, third set of stretch and folds, done. We're gonna cover this up. We're gonna come back and do our fourth set, our last set of stretch and folds in about 30 minutes. It's 11.15, so we're starting. Look how smooth this dough is. It's just letting me pull it up very easily. Okay, try one more right here. Eh. All right, so that one's been done. Now that we're done with our fourth set, it's time to start, well, the bulk ferment, we'll talk about um, bulk ferment, but after I'm done with my fourth set, I take it out of the bowl and I set it into 
a container that looks like this. Now I like using these flat sided square containers because it allows me to see how much this dough is going to rise. It has little markers here on the side and I'll show you a side view here in just a second. So I sprayed this container with some oil. Now I just put my dough in there after the um, fourth set of stretch and fold. So I'm gonna set this aside. Let's do our other, our other dough here. So we're working on our last and fourth set of stretch and folds. Let's get that one nice and... Now some people swear by doing five sets, some people swear by doing four. It just, it just depends. So I like to do four seems enough to be enough for me. So I have my other container, sprayed it with some oil. I'm just gonna take my dough out of this bowl, stick it into my prepared container here. I try to like to get the bigger pieces if anything was left behind. You don't have to worry about the smaller pieces, but try to get the, all the dough I can. All right, so let's get this lid on. Okay, so let's talk about bulk ferment for a second. Okay, so now we have the dough in these clear, um, smooth-sided containers. I reason I like these better because when you put your dough into a glass bowl, it's really hard to determine how much it's rising because that bowl has a curve to it. Having flat sided containers like this, I believe gave me a better view of the rise. Now I have been doing this for, I've made so many loaves that I know when my dough gets right underneath this too, like right where my finger is, that's when I produce the best loaves. So I'm gonna wait until this rises on my counter until it gets right underneath this too. So this is where I am not an expert at all. I know nothing really about bulk ferment. How I managed to kind of get mine right and figure mine out is I made loaf after loaf after loaf. And let me show you something. I'm gonna mention this, keep a bread baking journal. Now this is the journal I have. Every time you make sourdough, I want you to write down every single step that you complete from the temperature of your house to when you mix your dough to every time you do a stretch and fold. I mean, I get very detailed with my notes. So here is an example. Okay, here we go, perfect. So on Saturday, February 10th, I made a recipe. I also print pictures of each loaf that I make, the outside and the crumb, to document. But do you, do you see how detailed my notes are here? Okay, and it, oh, by the way, it goes on, that's not it, it goes on to the second set of pages. And if you go again, here's another one I made with the picture and the crumb shot. I have done this so many times where I have watched it bulk ferment on the counter and I know exactly what it gets to on that container and what has produced the best loaves for me. That's how I figured out. Now, there is a science behind this. Some people swear by the temperature of their dough. There is some method out there where you can actually figure out when bulk fermenting is done, the fermentation process is done by taking the temperature of your dough. Don't ask me to explain it. I have no idea what that even means. I haven't done it. You can also, there are some, also some things as far as visually that can help you determine whether if your bulk ferment is done. And I'll show this to you when, when it is done um, on my counter. But when you look around the edges of your bowl, where that sourdough is hitting the edges of bowls, you're gonna see some bubbles starting to appear. You're also going to see that dough coming into a dome on top, coming away from the sides of the bowl and coming to a little bit of a dome on top. And when you go and shake your bowl, it's jiggly like jello. These are some of the signs I look for. Another thing is when you 
poke your dough. You don't want it to spring back really fast and you don't want that indentation to stay. You want it to kind of slowly come back. When it slowly comes back, that's when I heard, you know, bulk fermentation is done. I don't know if any of these, these things are, are true or if they work or if what. I just know that I have taken my notes and I have gone back to my notes each time. Okay, I started my bulk fermentation at, at this time. Okay, it, ro it rose to this far on the jar. This is the type of loaf it produced. So I just know from trial and error and making so many loaves. And so if you, if you are just starting out, I highly, highly recommend keeping a bread baking journal. Now I can tell you from my experience that I let it rise on my counter for around four to five hours. That's when I produce the best loaves in my kitchen, in my home right now with the starters that I have. I'm, I'm not saying that's going to be for everybody. So I'm going to let them now sit in their containers like this on my counter for, like I said, around four and a half to five hours. That's another thing. If you're reading an ounce, an, a recipe, a sourdough recipe, and it is giving you times, use those times as a guideline. Do not use them as set in stone. Because the times that they're giving you in that recipe, I guarantee you are not going to be 100% the best thing and accurate for you. So if it says in that recipe, let it bulk ferment on your counter for six hours, use it as a guideline. Watch your dough. Check your dough. See what it's doing, how it's reacting. Come back to it. Watch it. Look after it. And once you have this, I will say, once I had this process down and I figured out what works best for me with my dough and everything else, I can step away. I don't have to sit here and constantly watch it and be like obsessive over it. I can come, I just, it's now more of a hands-off thing to me because I don't constantly have to watch it. So sitting on the counter now, we finished our four sets of sets of stretch and folds over a two hour period. Well, for me, it's been longer because I didn't do them exactly on the half hour mark. And now we're letting them finish the bulk fermenting process on the counter. People, um, the, the big thing for me was I always want to know when does the bulk fermentation process actually start? And I read conflicting things, but the most consistent answer I found is it starts when your starter and water is mixed, then it's happening. So the moment that we mix that water and that started together and we got that ball into that shaggy dough, that's when it started is what I have read, the most consistent answer I have found. So let these sit. We'll come back to these in like four and a half, five hours. Okay, so I'm going to show you this. This is where it's at currently. And it's a little bit higher than what I wanted, but that's okay. Um, this one's ready. The other one is not. So... One more thing that I did want to show you, I forgot to mention this. Now my oven, I don't even know what type this is, an LG or something, but on my oven, I have a proof setting. I don't know if you can see that, P-R-O-O-F, proof setting. So I have it on my, you can see the other ones in there. Ooh, that one's almost done as well. So we'll take that one out. But if I want to increase the speed at which my, dough is rising i'll put it in the oven on my proof setting but let's go ahead it's time to do the final shape and get them ready in their shaping baskets and put them in the fridge fridge for their cold ferment so i promised i would share with you kind of the signs that your bulk ferment is done if you look around the edges of my bowl there's a really good one right here you can see bubbles forming around the edge. There's another one over there forming. You can also, sorry, get my fingers out of the way. You can also see how it's taking back away from the sides of the container and it's forming a dome. I know it's hard to see in this container, but there is a very small dome happening. Also, when I shake it, it jiggles like jello. Now my dough is a little bit sticky, so I can't, it's hard for me right now to do the touch and spring test, the poke and spring test. 
um, but I tried right here and you can see it. I don't know, it's kind of hard to do with this one. I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and start the shaping process. For this process, to start the next step, we're, gonna, we're in our shaping step. After your dough has been done bulk fermenting on the counter and has doubled in size or just doubled, I use silicone um, shaping baskets for mine. You will see um, ones that look like wood baskets, really any container that um, will fit inside of your baking vessel. Now I'm using Dutch ovens today. What I mean by that is you don't want, for instance, I wouldn't want a basket that's bigger than my Dutch oven because then when I go to put it in my Dutch oven, it won't fit. So you wanna make sure that whatever shaping container that you are using for your cold ferment for the um, last bit of rise on your dough will actually fit inside of whatever you're baking in. I This is how I prep my shaping baskets. Okay, I have a water bottle. This is just a fine mister. And then once I have that misted, I use a white rice flour. And this is what I'm going to use to flour the inside of my basket. And I'm just using this utensil. I don't even know what it's called, sprinkler. <laughs> and I like to just go to town because I don't want any type of sticking when I go to pull my dough out of this. Okay, so that's pretty good. I got some on my counter, but that's all right. So that one's been done. We are going to, now I asked my husband, I said, Do you, so let's talk about shapes. You can see one is round. This is ca called a boule. I think that's how you pronounce it, B-O-U-L-E. That is a round shape. Then we have like more of an oval shape. This is called a batard. I asked my husband what he wanted the cheddar and jalapeno one to be, he wanted it to be the oval batard shape, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do, I decided I don't have enough jalapeno and cheddar to make both loaves, so I'm gonna do one plain today. So we're gonna be shaping our round loaf. So this is what I do. Okay, get it out of our proving container. Just give it a nice little, come on. Should come out pretty clean came out pretty clean and what you can see i have a lot of bubbles going on so how you shape this this is how i do it i spread it out until i can get i get like a rectangle like this this so it looks like a rectangle and the first thing I do is I pull up, I stretch and pull over, I stretch and pull over, and then I take the next side and I stretch and I start rolling towards me. Now this is how I do it. I have no idea if it's right. Okay, once that's done, if you can still see that, I pinch my ends, I tuck, and as your fingers are sliding underneath the dough, you want to roll towards you. The reason being is you want to get nice tension on top of that dough. Now, you can see I have a nice tension. It's ripped even a little bit, which is bad. We don't want that. You're going to put it in your basket, seam side up, smooth side down. And this is what, now I don't focus on this process being perfect, okay? I am not a shape master. In fact, I have no idea if I'm even shaping it correctly, but this is how I've done it. I think they've turned out pretty well. So now that that one is shaped smooth side down in our shaping basket, I use these little covers like this. So after I cover it with a little cover, kind of looks like um, a shower cap is what it reminds me of. So once that's on there, I'm going to let this rest 
on my counter for about 30 minutes. Okay, so while we were doing that, the other one is ready. It hasn't risen as much as that one, but pretty still pretty good. I'm going to get my basket prepped, getting that water on there. And I spray the water on there just so that the rice flour sticks because these are silicone. And if you did not spray the water on there, the, the rice flour would just slip down, would fall down the sides. This gets it so the rice flour sticks to the basket so I get no sticking of the dough when I pull this out of here. Okay, that's pretty good. We are now going to shape a batard. It's kind of like the same way that I did the shaping of the round one where I tuck my hands under the dough and pulled towards me. Tuck, pull, tuck, pull, tuck, pull. This one's going to be a little bit different because we're doing an oval shape. So let's get it out of the basket. Okay, same thing. I'm seeing the bubbles form along the edges. It's pulled away from the edges. It's got a nice little dome. It's nice and jiggly, smooth on top. All the signs that I am good with my bolt from it. Now, like I said, I don't know anything about checking the temperature of the dough. That pulled out really nice and clean. Okay, so now we have, this is where we're going to do our inclusions. Now remember, like I said, I am not a sourdough master. In fact, the last time I tried inclusions, it did not work for me. <laughs> it was, turned out not so good, in fact, I don't think we even ate it. So I'm gonna try to get, I'm gonna get my inclusions all set up over here. Okay. So what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna try to get this rectangle spread out as much as I can. Okay. So you wanna get this into, without really breaking the dough, nice stretches. All right, so we have a nice rectangle there. Got that stretched out nice. This is how I saw it done on YouTube. This is the way before when I tried inclusion, I just put it in when I was doing my stretch and folds. Now I'm gonna add it prior to my shaping. So I'm just going to add some jalapenos. You're gonna spread them out. And I'm really glad I decided to only do one loaf because I really don't think I would have had enough jalapenos now i'm not tech i'm not really a spice person my husband is mexican um, and loves spice grew up on spice i grew up in an asian family where we really um we favored salt <laughs> sodium in our diets uh so i'm not a huge spice person but let's go ahead i want a lot of cheddar in my loaf so as you can see i um Got these cut down pretty small sizes. I just cut it down into small chunky squares. I'm gonna put these all over. Get them evenly, as evenly as possible. And how many inclusions, how much of inclusions you want is completely up to you. Like I said, there's no rhyme or reason to what I'm doing here. I'm just adding as I'm going. So now that that's done, I'm going to attempt to roll this and get this shaped. So the first thing is like this, okay? And I'm going to add some inclusions here on top of here. And like I said, I have no idea what this is gonna do. This is how I saw someone else do it on YouTube. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot different than what I did the first time. And in my, when I did it, it didn't turn out so well. So we're gonna try your way. So add inclusions there. I believe now we fold like this. Okay. And whew, running out of jalapenos, gotta spread these out kind of thin. Okay, get those done. Get some cheddar on there. Let's do this side, very good. Get some in there. 
use up the rest of my jalapenos. And my jalapenos dried out a little bit, not a ton. So I am a little bit worried about the moisture, but we will give it a shot now. I'm gonna take that top part, make sure you guys can see that, okay. Take that tarp, top part and roll it down towards me. So we're just rolling up that dough. We're rolling it up like a burrito kind of. All right, whew, that's big. All right, I'm going to pinch my ends like I did. And this is how I do my batards. I have no idea if it is correct or not, but I, here, let's move this over here like this, okay. I tuck my hand, my fingers underneath the dough and pull towards me. Tuck and pull. Tuck and pull, and that's as far as I go. Remember, you want to go seed, seam side up, smooth side down. Okay, so that moisture is breaking my dough, which makes me a little bit worried, but it's okay. We'll we'll figure it out. Like I said, it's one of those things where it's like, you just gotta either trust the process or and if it doesn't turn out this time, well, you know what? There's always a next time. It's nothing, sourdough's nothing to cry over. I think I got that wrapped up pretty good. I'm just trying to close up some of these breakings that I'm seeing happen. It'll be okay. It'll be all right, it'll be all right. So those are about both in there. Let me get this wrapped up. Okay, I'm gonna let these sit on the counter for about 30 minutes for one little last rest. And then we'll go ahead and stick these in the fridge. Here is a better look at the rice flour that I use. And I know I'm gonna ask what type of cheese I'm using. I heard for the jalapeno cheddar sourdough to use sharp cheddar. So I just bought a block of Tillamook sharp cheddar cheese and cut them up. The reason, and this is just what I read, the re and I don't know if it's true, so you can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but I read that the reason you use the rice flour when you are um, lining your baskets and when you are scoring your dough is because I guess this doesn't have gluten in it, so it doesn't mess with the structure of your dough. Like I said, this is just what I read. I don't know if that's true, um, but it does help with the sticking, like I said, on my baskets, and it does produce a really white uh, skin when I do my scoring, so my, my um, pretty scoring pattern shows up. Sometimes I use it to score my dough, sometimes I don't, and I'll show you that when we get to that process. Let's let these, so these are going to sit on the counter for 30 minutes, and then I'm gonna pop them over to my fridge where they're going to sit anywhere from 24 to 36 hours. Yes, you heard that right. I've had them in the fridge for as long and short a period as anywhere between five and 12 hours. So the reason I heard that you put the sourdough in the fridge for a cold ferment is because one, it, it develops a nice skin on your dough so it's easier to score. I also read that the longer you keep it in the fridge, the more sour your dough, your bread is going to be. So if you like that distinctive sourdough taste, in your bread, the longer you keep it in the fridge, I guess the more it develops that flavor. Second, or third, I heard that it develops these really nice blisters on the outside of your cooked or your baked loaves. I guess those blisters are a sign that it's good bread. I don't know. I get the blisters every single time I do this process. They're not like huge ginormous blisters like I see on some other loaves, they're smaller blisters, so hey. With or without the blisters, I've had both types of loaves come out. It all tastes this good. The purpose for me, uh, I, like I said, I don't sell these. So for me, I'm just looking to develop and bake a good loaf of bread that my family is going to enjoy. That's my end goal here. It's not to 
you know, sell or produce the most perfect, most beautiful loaf in the world is to feed my family. Um, so 30 minutes on the counter and then we're going to pop it in the fridge and I'll see you back here anywhere between, I don't know, 12 and 36 hours. Okay, so it's now the next day and I'm going to show you the process of feeding my starter and what discard means and what it looks like. So let's get started. Now, this is from yesterday. I like to feed my starter every um, morning with the exception of baking. Now, if I know I'm going to be baking bread, I will feed my starter in the evening and I will bake with it in the morning. But if I'm not baking with it and I'm just maintaining it and I'm feeding it every day, then I am going to be feeding it in um, the morning. Now, I try to bake with my starters, like I said, around three to four times a week. Um, so it just depends. So this is to rise a lot. And what I do is you can see I have my scale out and my clean jar. Now, there are some people who discard um, this is my discard here. This is the jar that I keep my discard in. Now you can see it is very full at the moment, but it won't be once I make some pizza crust and some crackers or some homemade English muffins. Um, so this is my discard. Some people will discard directly into their jar and then just reuse the same jar over and over again to feed. I don't do that. I feed into a clean jar. So I have my clean jar, I'm gonna zero out my scale, and I just take one of these small spatulas and I do 50 grams of starter. I try to get about 50 grams now, sometimes it's a little over, sometimes a little under. Doesn't have to be exactly 50, but I try to get pretty close. All right, so I have 51 grams of starter in my clean jar. Remember with my jar of water that I keep out on the counter, this is room temperature water um, that I got straight from my tap. I leave it out on the counter, zero that out, and now I'm gonna do 51 grams of water into my jar, 51. All right, and then I'm gonna take my King Arthur all-purpose, I'm just using an all-purpose flour, and I'm gonna do 51 grams of flour into my clean jar. Make sure to zero out your scale. I do measure and I tend to stick to my measurements, but I also go by consistency as well. If my starter, see I'm going, okay, I just put in 53 grams. And so I'm gonna get my spatula and I'm just gonna stir it. I like to stir mine so all the chunks are out to the, for the most part, it doesn't have to be perfect. And see like, see this consistency? I'm okay with that consistency and get my sides down. All right, so that's fed. Let me get my, remember I like a clean, there we go. Okay, so now that that is done, I'm going to pop that over in my starter area. So that Sarize a lot has been fed. Now, do you remember, we only added 50 grams of Sarizalot into that jar, so we still have some left inside of our jar. This is discard. We take what we need to feed our starter and we discard the rest. And so I'm going to put all this into my discard jar. And this is what you can use. See how it's runny? This is starter that has peaked and deflated. And I try to get every little bit I can out of there because you don't wanna be dumping this stuff down your sinks. I just washed this out with really, 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 really hot water. And that's how I feed both my starters. Okay, it's about 6.40 on Monday morning, which means it's been about 48 hours since we started this entire process because if you remember, we started on Saturday around 6.40 in the morning. Now. I must say, I never usually leave my um, dough in the fridge this long. However, yesterday life got busy. We had to play football, so we're doing it today. I would say usually 12 to 24 hours in the fridge has always worked best for me. Um, that produces a nice skin, gives me um, a nice little spring. I, 
I just produce the best loaves if it's around 12 to 24 hours. So we're doing it a little bit after that. So we'll see how they turn out. Let me show you some of the tools that I use for this part of the journey. So this is where we're gonna be taking our dough out of the fridge, out of those shaping baskets, and we're gonna be scoring our bread and putting it in the oven. So for this part of the, the journey, I need you to preheat the oven to 450 degrees with your Dutch oven and lid inside of the oven. It is very, very, very important that you check with the manufacturer of your Dutch oven to see how high of heat it can take. There are some Dutch ovens that are fine with heat at 480, 500 degrees. There are some Dutch ovens that are only good until 450, 400 degrees. Also, with the lid on, you need to make sure that that lid can withstand the temperature of 450 degrees or higher. And the reason I say that is because some Dutch oven lids have handles that are made of different uh, material than just the cast iron. So 450 degrees Dutch oven inside of the oven as it preheats and you're going to let it preheat even if your little oven timer goes off preheat it for an entire hour. I do that to make sure and ensure that my Dutch ovens are really, really warm before I stick my bread in there. Also, when I do this part, I take them out of the fridge, I score them and I stick them straight into the Dutch, hot Dutch oven in, in my oven. Um, so I don't let it rest on the counter or anything, it's straight from the fridge to the oven. So with all that being said, let me show you the tools that I use. So this is what I use now. Like everything else, there are always some people swear by not using the baking mats and only using the parchment paper. Um, for me, the baking mats have worked great. Now these are like a silicone type of baking mat. I like them because they're reusable. I use them over and over and over again. Um, I have cut off the ends. Now that these are little handles that allow you to put your bread on here and you can use the handles to lower it into your hot Dutch oven. I cut my handles off, that way my handles are not coming out of my Dutch oven. Some people simply flap them over the sides of their Dutch oven and put the lid on. I didn't like mine sticking out, so I cut them off. I saw them in a YouTube video to do that. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but it's what I do. All right, I also have some little steel, uh, stainless steel surgical scissors. I use these for scoring designs. Now, lames. I have a couple of different. I have this round little one that gives me, I feel a little more control with the more intricate designs. I have a taller lame that I use. This is what I use for my big score um, that I'm gonna be showing you today. It's where the, st the steam can es escape. Um, after this video, I'm showing my tools. I'll, I'll explain a little bit why we need to score our bread. And then I use some string. If I'm doing an intricate design and I, and I want to kind of place where my lines are going to be on my bread before scoring, kind of mapping out my design, I'll use string to do that. That's it. This is what I use. Now, you don't need any of this stuff. You don't need any of this stuff to make bread. You need some parchment paper and a knife to make your score. That's it. As I've gone along, scoring is really my creative outlet and this is what I love. All right, so let's talk very quickly about why we score our bread. Now scoring is when we take our bread out of the fridge and we cut a line down our, our dough, our loaf. Now the reason we do that is so the steam knows where to escape in our bread. When you put your dough in that hot Dutch oven, it's the steam that's in there that's going to produce a nice little spring. Some people swear by adding ice cubes to their Dutch oven to produce more spring in the blisters on their skin. I don't because I have seen horror stories of people's Dutch ovens actually exploding and breaking in their oven. I saw one story on Facebook where this lady, gosh, poor lady, her Dutch oven exploded in the oven and busted out her oven door. Could you imagine if she was standing in front of that oven door when that happened? All by it was they were I was reading it was because she added ice cubes to her Dutch oven to produce more more steam for her loaf. It's not worth it. I get beautiful bakes and loaves without adding the ice cube to my Dutch oven. So 
But adding that score line, adding that cut into your loaf is going to allow you to tell the bread, the seam, where to escape in your dough. If you don't, your dough is going to kind of just bust open wherever the steam is going to escape. So we do this to give it a little bit of a better look, nice score down the middle, steam can escape where we are telling it to escape. This scoring, people have really complicated, have really got intricate, have really got intensive, <laughs> really intense with the scoring of their dough. I mean, I have seen anything from 3D scoring to making bunny rabbits to 3D butterflies. I mean, it, it's quite remarkable. True artistry. I love it. I'm a creative person. This is my outlet on my sour. This is what I love about the process. Like all this other stuff we've done before this, I'm like, just get me to this process so I can score my dough and make it look beautiful. Today, I'm going to be doing some simple scoring. Um, that way I don't want to overcomplicate it. You can, like in the big, um, like earlier in this video, I, I shared that book that I love, The Art of, of Scoring. I love it. It taught me a lot of really cool techniques and I'm able to get some really, really beautiful art on my loaves. So my, my oven is still preheating. I'll show you um, here in just a second when we're going to pull those Dutch ovens out of the oven and start our scoring process. I hope you guys can see this okay. So I'm gonna take this off. <sighs> All right. So this is what I do. Right or wrong, I don't know. Put this on like this. Flip it. Should just release. Boom. Okay. Awesome. You might also want to get a brush like this. Okay, if you want, you can sprinkle some rice flour on your loaf. And for this one, we're just gonna do a really simple score. I'm gonna do a cross. And when I know that's where I want it to be, then I will give it a pretty deep score. Remember, this is just telling the bread, hey, I want the steam to escape right here. All right, so we have our cut. Now you're gonna take your Dutch oven. This is a very hot Dutch oven. And this is a Staub, S-T-A-U-B, is the one that I have. And I'm just gonna pick this up and place it in my very, very hot Dutch oven. Okay, so it looks like this in my Dutch oven. I'm going to put my lid back on and I'm going to stick it back in the oven. All right, so this was our dough with the inclusions. Put this on. For this score, an S kind of snake score. Now, some of your inclusions might get in the way. Now, when you're scoring, you don't want to score straight down. You want to score at more of like a 45 degree angle. And this is going to give you that really popular ear that you might read about in sourdough. All right, so now we got to take out our Dutch oven. Don't forget to put your oven mitts on. I have a, an oval Dutch oven that I use for my Batards shapes. This is a Cuisinart. I think I'm pronouncing that right. All right, pick this up, stick it inside, just like that. Okay, so now look like that. You're going to put your lid back on. Okay, so now those are gonna be in the oven at 450. 
Okay, so we just got them both in the oven. We're gonna keep them in the oven and bake at 450 for 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, we're gonna drop the temperature down to 410 and bake for another 10 to 15 minutes or as long as you would like to get the color on the crust or the skin as dark as you want it to. I don't like my doves, my loaves super dark, um, so I go about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, before I pull my loaves out of the oven for the final time, I'll check it with um, an internal temp. I try to get the thermometer around 206 to 210. Um, Fahrenheit with the internal temperature of the bread just to make sure it's cooked all the way through but um, I'll show you when I pull these out of the oven okay so now I'm just gonna take a thermometer like this an instant read thermometer and I'm just going to check they've been um, without the lid off now temperature 410 for about 15 minutes I'm just gonna check and see what my internal temp is Oh, perfect. 209. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and take these out of the oven, and I'll give you a top view of what these look like. Get that out. There's one more thing I want to show you. So we just pulled the bread out of the oven. I put a cookie sheet on the rack directly below my Dutch ovens, and this helps it from the bottom of your bread to burn. I've never had burnt bottom on my loaves, and this is what I do to prevent that. So give you a top view. Now I've never made the cheddar jalapeno before, and it looks like we did have some leakage of the cheese, but I think it should be okay. Let's go ahead and take these out and get them on our cooling rack. Okay, so there you have it. We have our plain um, rounder loaf and our oval cheddar and jalapeno. Now, you've come along with me. I have never made a cheddar and jalapeno one before. Um, it's making me a little nervous because the inside seems, I think the cheese released a lot more oil than what I was expecting. Um, so, you want to get them onto a cooling rack. You're going to want to let these cool 100% completely. I don't even cut into my bread for at least four hours. Um, you really want to give it time to cool, especially when you're using like inclusions like this, just because so much has drained out of these inclusions. And I just want to make sure everything is 100% cooled down before I cut into any of these. So I'll be back in four hours to show you the crumb or the inside of the bread, which really sh shows you what kind of bread you have. If it's super dense and gummy, it's going to tell you a lot. The inside of your bread tells you a lot, and we'll come back to that in about four hours. But you can see I have the beautiful little blisters on my sourdough. And this one smells incredible. Four hours later. Okay, so we are here. We are going to now cut our loaf open and see how the crumb is on the inside. Now, what I love about sourdough is this sound. That really flaky, crunchy crust. Some people like a softer sourdough. Ah, oh, that is a great crumb. Let me show you. So it's a little dark in here. I'm losing daylight, but that is, I'm happy with that crumb. You have a nice spring back when you, now here's the thing that most people don't know. And I hear, I see a lot of people say, well, my sourdough is gummy on the inside. It has this almost like gummy feel and, and taste sourdough is naturally a little gummy it's not going to be like your typical dry bread that you get from the store so this is beautiful it has a nice spring back it has nice beautiful open air pockets it's this is a great loaf i'm happy with that the one that i'm worried about that i feel is going to be maybe a little dense or a little flat or a little gummy is going to be this cheddar and 
jalapeno loaf just because anytime you add inclusions, you're not going to get the same spring as a plain loaf. You're just not. Those, those inclusions are going to weigh down your, your dough and your loaf in the oven. But when I brought this out, it was, uh, it was, yeah, scary. So let's see. Moment of truth. <sighs> oh my gosh. I am so happy with that. Look how beautiful that is. All those inclusions are evenly spaced. I still have really nice, beautiful air pockets and it's not as dense as I thought it was gonna be. Toast some of this up with some butter. That's gonna be beautiful. I'd love for you to give this a taste, babe. So that is the entire process. <laughs> of me making my loaves of sourdough, everything I've kind of learned, my different processes with my starter and how I make things and the things that I use. All I can say, if you really, I know there are so many people out there, if you were like me, who was like petrified to start this process, who was scared to start because it seems so overwhelming and super, super complicated, it doesn't have to be. There are methods out there where this can be as simple as you want it to be. And you can complicate this as much as you want it to. My point here is just freaking start. Start your starter. S start your starter. Take a little bit of flour, 50 grams of flour, boom. 50 grams of water, boom. Stick it in a jar, stir it together. You just started a sourdough starter. Get started. Because after I started my starter, that's when I got brave enough to start doing other things. In fact, my first sourdough recipe I ever made wasn't a loaf of bread. It was banana nut muffins. Because I was starting to discard a little bit of my starter into the fridge. All that being said, just take the leap and start. I mean, it's just bread. If something goes wrong, it doesn't work out, that's okay. It's just bread. You can always start over or try again or learn more. And so if this is something that really interests you, I know for me here at home, it has changed a lot for me as far as what we eat and what I make. I've been baking a lot more and making a lot more. And I enjoy it. It's not work. I'm not dreading it. I love whipping out homemade pizza. And by the way, the sourdough pizza crust is so fun if to make if you have children. My son loves to be involved in that process. Like I said, homemade crackers. You can literally make anything from sourdough discard. And it's amazing and super easy and way better than anything you would probably buy at the store. So if you're wanting to start, I hope this video, if anything, for y'all to rush out and make your sourdough starter and just start, that's my hope. And then I hope you take it a step further and actually start the bread making process or even heck, don't even start with bread. Start with some easy discard recipes. Like I said, everything from this video is gonna be in the caption of this video. If you found this video helpful, please like it and don't forget to subscribe. I just had to go get my dog who had a baby toy in his mouth. Anyways. <laughs>